Welcome to NDM English, I am Nate, and in this video we will discuss The Rats in the Walls, a story by H.P. Lovecraft that builds up a terrifying revelation. The author is not known for his writing abilities, but he is good at building suspense and creating modern mythology. Many horror writers were inspired by his stories to write their own fearful tales. When H.P. Lovecraft is good, he uses highly suggestive descriptions of what his characters witness and claim to have experienced, opening up the reader's imaginations to fill in the blanks. They participate in building these horror-filled worlds and increase the dread that turns his characters often into mad lunatics. Because he comes from the era of pop fiction, his writing mechanics can be poor and amateurish. There isn't a buildup of character arcs or sophisticated plots, often repeating his own themes in formulaic stories. He doesn't use dialogue very often, instead using first-person narratives as if writing a letter. These are more witness testimony than imaginative expressions. There are a few groundbreaking gems hidden beneath the wooden words, much like the secrets the rats are about to lead the main character of this short story to discover. A few names of characters are mentioned in The Rats in the Walls, but only the last name of Delapore is given any substance to the main character, although that last name is the most important. The story is about a man who rebuilds his ancestral home in England after hearing ghastly rumors about his family's past. At first, he didn't know much about his family's history, other than a few generations ago, one of his relatives left England and immigrated to Virginia in the United States. The only remaining evidence of an historical record was a letter passed down from father to son, but that tradition ended with the Civil War, when the Union soldiers destroyed his town of Carfax. The letter was burned in the fire that also took his grandfather, the accumulated wealth, his home, and the entire town. His father served in what must have been the Confederate Army, although that is not specified, and then after the war, helped his wife and son escape to the north, where it was explained that his wife came from. Rumors of his family in England apparently go further than anyone else who lived in that area. The last rehearsed history of the De La Poor family is of a son who, during the kingship of James I, was accused of murdering the family. Because no one liked the family and believed them to be extremely wicked, the son fled and never returned. The family estate, Exum Priory, as it was called, had extraordinary architecture. Not only were there relatively modern structures, but a mixture of Roman, Celtic, and even earlier stonework. The implication is that the later families merged with earlier ones and borrowed or continued the customs of those who lived there in the past. All of this was lost, for better or as the peasants of the English countryside would claim, the worst, after moving to Virginia and then, after the Civil War, Massachusetts. There is no mention that the Delapores, having changed the spelling of their name, were disliked by those in the new land across the ocean, but they were still considered outsiders. Whatever the family did for a living, and they were prosperous, it wasn't because they were farmers or landowners. Perhaps they were merchants because they lived next to a waterway. At any rate, unlike their planter neighbors, as the narrator calls them, the Delapores had no family stories beyond the confines of the shores they landed as immigrants. The other residents told tales back down to the Crusades. The irony is that the Delapores would be able to tell their history if they could, most likely family stories going back at least to the Roman era of Caesar, if not further. That isn't to say they would want to know or repeat their chronicles. As was mentioned, the narrator's family moved to Massachusetts after the Civil War to once again become regular members of society. In fact, the narrator says he became a wealthy businessman before deciding to return to England and restore his family estate, Exum Priory, on what the locals consider a cursed land. What made him interested in restoring this home was that his son left for the Great War and wrote him while in England about local legends. 
They are filled with a mixture of family tragedies, mysterious misfortunes, and ghosts or monsters in superstitions. His son returned seriously injured from the war and died a few years later, perhaps out of memorial to his son and as the last male in the family line. He took up the work of restoring the estate and moved there to live. This, despite the locals taking issue with resurrecting the place and expressing disdain for his return. Heredity was not the culprit in the more heinous of rumors about the family. Misbehavior and evil deeds were reported about any who entered the family through marriage. There seemed to be a core group in the family that was known for taking control of the others, continuing a lifestyle of terrible consequences. Entering the family did not automatically turn a person evil if they were not predisposed. Whatever terrible deeds there might have been drove one woman and her mother to murder her Delapore husband with the blessing of the local priest. Yet there was nothing noted specifically why they killed the man, putting the question of innocence by self-defense into question. This was, after all, a hated family, and any excuse to get rid of them seemed acceptable. Something would cause people to do things they normally wouldn't, acceptable by the locals or not. The narrator claims that what he hears about his family's past bothers him, but he continues trying to find out more about the disturbing past. He is drawn to evil very much as if wanting to be a part of it, while at the same time repulsed. There is an inner struggle going on that he hints at, but doesn't seem to fully acknowledge. As for the ghosts and monsters said to lurk the grounds around the ancestral home, he dismisses them as fancy over-imaginations. Three tales interest him the most. Bat-winged creatures who perform witches' rituals, a white creature run over by a horse, and most of all, a legion of rats that pour out of the estate after its destruction to ravage the countryside, eating animals and even two humans before dispersing. The story of rats would, of course, become important soon enough. Even while skeptical, his dreams and subconscious grasp hold of the scene, eventually as expected. They would lead him to the final revelations about the estate, his family, and deeper, darker histories. Finishing up the restoration, he starts to settle into the new home and begin to forget all the rumors and terrible stories. He only wants to live the last days of his life in comfort. That is, of course, not going to be possible. Similar to H.P. Lovecraft, the narrator loves cats and has a black cat given an unfortunate name that he loves the most. H.P. Lovecraft also had an unfortunately named cat and often put cats into his stories. In this story, all of the cats start to act strange and pay a lot of attention to certain parts of the home, pawing and making sounds at the walls. He and his hired servants try to determine why the cats are acting so strangely, but they don't notice anything unusual. There are moments when the cats act normal, but they occasionally return to their strange behavior. Eventually, the favorite black cat will be central in leading the narrator down a very dark path, both literally and figuratively. The black cat acts as a companion and talisman of protection. It becomes a warning signal that things are no longer normal, if they ever were. Whatever curses existed in the past start up again. The cats bring to attention the unusual energy building up, about to burst into history again. At first, the narrator is confused by the cat's attention to the walls, but he too starts hearing mysterious sounds coming from behind the wallpaper. A few nights later, he sees the wallpaper move, as if rats found a way to break through the wall, struggling to get out from imagination and burst into reality. Traps are set in case there really are rats coming out from the walls. When they are sprung, no rat or other animal can be found stuck or dead. This gives the impression the rats are only partially part of reality. They become trickster ghosts, seen only in peripheral vision, teasing their existence. It is as if they live as both nightmarish dreams and spectral poltergeists reaching into the physical world. The cats might be protection against these demonic rats, but they also 
draw in and call this evil to the world. Dreams become more prominent in the story as well, with the black cat becoming the representation of a bridge between consciousness and sleep. Its color in superstition already gives the impression of a sinister animal that doesn't always have the best interests of humans. There is a greedy passion driving it to uncover and chase down the rats, like two ancient enemies always at each other's throats, although seeming to be the hero ready to protect the master. Hunger and territorial behavior are the main purpose for trying to get at the rats. Because the rats are probably not completely in the realm of the conscious world, the cat brings the narrator into the unconscious realm. Whenever the cat lies down on the master's feet, horrific dreams are manifest. The narrator's dreams become even more horrible each time he has nightmares. There is a swineherd who drives his flock of ugly beasts around the estate. Scary as the scene might be, it becomes worse when hordes of rats come pouring out of the walls and start killing both the animals and humans. The narrator wakes, either to find the cat disturbed by his unrest or the cat trying to get at the supposed rats in the walls. His final dream allows him to see in detail the ugly beasts, and it frightens him enough to jump out of his sleep. This is soon followed by the discovery of an altar when him and his friend Nori decide to do some exploring in the sub-basement, convinced that the cats are aware of some dark secrets. What they find later indicates all these beasts are actually humans who have devolved after years of torture and imprisonment. It is unknown if H.P. Lovecraft meant these nightmarish swineherd animals to be related to the New Testament pigs taken over by the evil spirit legions. There is some similarity with the dreadful ending of their lives because of satanic forces, but it probably only has circumstantial relationships. As they look more closely at the altar, they discover both pre-Roman pictures and that an opening exists below it. A draft blows on the flames of their lantern, indicating more to be discovered. The narrator isn't sure if he wants to move the altar because he is worried about what he might find by digging deeper. However, he's too curious and decides to go into the city and find scientists and archaeologists to assist in the excavation. He seems intrigued by the evil and doesn't want to keep things buried. There's a struggle to be a good person and reject his family's dark history, but he also wants to become a participant in that history. He wants to dig deeper and in the process might end up going too far. Some things are best left underground, but he doesn't want to let go, like his ancestors who moved to Virginia, seemingly breaking the curse, save for one of the family members who got involved with voodoo after returning from the Mexican War. None of the explorers seem to be worried what it is that they will find. But once the altar is moved, they discover a lot of horrible visions. At first, they are fascinated by the mixed and very old architecture of the underground caverns. When they look down at the ground, they are shocked and horrified by all the terrible skeletons lying on the ground in various conditions of fully put together and scattered parts. Even more disturbing is how some were cowering as if in fear trying to get away from others, while those others seem to be trying to consume them. More amazing still is that many of them were semi-human and in various stages of evolution. The further back they went, the more rooms they found, with horrors worse than the last. They found a huge cavern where a lot more skeletons could be found, as well as evidence of rituals that led to cannibalism. They did find another place that was a kitchen where cannibalistic ritual food preparation was laid out with the tools necessary for that job. Humans and their ancestors have always been a violent species, never able to get rid of their natural and unnatural instincts. There's not a distance we can go back in time when the horrors inflicted on other humans cannot be found. As the narrator points out by these discoveries, the Great War killed his son, the Union Army destroyed his grandfather with fire, and he, in turn, 
will have revenge in a never-ending cycle. The caverns represent the history of humans going back millennia and generations before the modern human, at a time before history. The rats that he finds will eat what remains of the human violence and for a time leave nothing but bones. But those bones cannot be hidden forever. No amount of new masonry to cover old or destroyed buildings covered by a layer of dirt will keep the truth from coming back. The rats that dispose of the secrets will also be the ones that expose them. There are only two types of humans in this story, victims of tyrants and evil and those who inflict that evil on them. It isn't always certain who is on what side or when choices of the past will spill over into the present. Click the subscribe button and notification bell to not miss the next installments and analysis.